I was uh, recruited to give this talk because uh, I made a snide remark to the organizers that I never found a satisfactory description of how the polyphase filter bank worked. Uh, it was usually uh, a person gave a description. He referred to the Z-plane transform of the uh, filter, had a few up-down arrows to uh, indicate up-sampling and down-sampling, and then said you needed a noble identity, and you mix all these all together, and a miracle happens. <laughs> so I will attempt to explain it in a little more detail for people who aren't experts in uh, Z-plane transforms. So the polyphase filter bank uh, was invented by these very clever chaps led by Bellinger, uh, and his associates that wrote many papers in the mid-70s, digital filtering by polyphase network applications of sample rate uh, alteration and filter banks. That was 1974. This was only uh, nine years after the famous uh, Kulituki paper algorithm, which we just heard about in 1965. So a lot happened in nine years. These are two seminal advances in uh, signal processing. And to give you the quick version, the key principle in uh, the polyphase filter bank is what's called the noble identity. And this is the first one. It shows that the process of filtering and then dance down sampling, which is called dissemination, uh, can be interchanged to re reduce the computational workload. So in other words, if you have a filter a, a, which reduces the bandwidth, you reduce the bandwidth and you can take half the samples, in this case, uh, uh, decimating by a factor of two. But then you've ended up with uh, a, a half the samples out here and you've wasted a lot of uh, the computations you did up front here. So the key idea is you can actually, by some miracle, interchange the downsampling and the filtering. And this seems absurd because the Nyquist rate is sacred. You can't do anything to, you can't downsample first and then filter. But it turns out by this very clever process, you can do that. And it adds up all the signals so that you exactly cancel out all the aliasing problems that we uh, heard about. So Friday, I was uh, preparing my talk, and uh, I call up my classmate at MIT, Al Oppenheim, who many of you might have heard, and said, what is the noble identity? Where does that name come from? Uh, and it turns out, I couldn't find this in any textbook, but uh, he referred to me. He said he uh, spoke to this, his uh, buddy out of Caltech, who's still alive, P.P. Uh, Vidanathan, and uh, my Anathan told him that, uh, well, Nobel, Noble is not a person. It's not named after a person like Nyquist. Uh, he just uh, called these uh, relationships uh, Noble uh, because he thought, you know, it, it referred to the fact that they possessed outstanding qualities. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of interesting, I thought. Anyway, let's take a step back to... Uh, those old days before 1965, before the fast Fourier transforms and before polyphase filter banks. And let's say uh, you had a, a sequence, this is a white Gaussian noise, for example, uh, and uh, you sample it uh, at the requisite uh, two samples per inverse bandwidth. And let's say you just wanted to do a low pass filtering on this and you really wanted to do a good low-pass filter job. So you would ideally like to have just this uh, thing. I call that a boxcar. Uh, that that's, shows my age. They're now, it's now called a top hat function. <laughs> so you want to get as close to this uh, filter shape as possible, and it's going to be a low-pass filter, so it's going to re greatly reduce the bandwidth. So you design a filter in the time domain to try to uh, approximate this. And if you have many samples, uh, you can do a pretty good job. That's what the whole uh, 
uh, area of finite impulse response filters is. You take a lot of samples and weight them in a convolutional type filter, and you can get uh, fairly close to this if you have a large number of conv convolving uh, samples here. Uh, so uh, you just uh, digitally have these digital samples here, and you have digital samples of HT. You would just uh, convolve this with this, and that in the frequency domain, as we've heard many times, you just multiply by that uh, the frequency response function H of F, and you get a, a pretty good low-pass filter. Well, that means uh, the bandwidth is greatly reduced here if you have R caps. This is a very fundamental parameter, which I'm going to use. It corresponds to the number of taps in the, uh, in the, uh, in the filter. And you reduce the bandwidth, and then after that, you can uh, uh, throw out every rth. All, you just have to sample every rth uh, sample to uh, demonstrate that you've uh, uh, reduced the bandwidth. And if you wanted to build a uh, uh, filter bank, you could have another filter out here, a bandpass filter. You do the same thing, do all these multiplies, and you could build up the whole spectrum uh, that way. So that's incredibly inefficient. You've got all these multiplies here, which are just going to be thrown away later. And every time you create a new filter, you've, uh, you're not using the FFT, so you're in an n square re regime. So this was incredibly painful back when uh, computers were uh, very slow and had no roach chips uh, to do the processing. So uh, the coming of the FFT was a major uh, event. So this is why it's very important to be able to interchange the, the filtering operation and the sampling operation if you can manage uh, to do it. So let's take a look at the uh, classical method of uh, spectral analysis, which you've actually seen already. So this is a repeat. Uh, here's my white noise spectrum, or whatever uh, the power spectrum is. X of t transforms into the Fourier transform. And if you want the power, you square the uh, spectrum. We have to uh, operate on a finite number of uh, time samples here. So we multiply the time st stream by this uh, boxcar or top hat function, which has length t. And so that's uh, a function which has a Fourier transform and the uh, power version of a transform squared. So we're multiplying the signals x and h. So that means in the uh, frequency domain, we're convolving the uh, two spectra to get the output spectrum. In my I have a very limited ability in PowerPoint, I couldn't find a convolution symbol, so I had to write it. <laughs> so that's the convolution of the two uh, spectra. So it's critically important that you know the characteristics of this, uh, uh, this transform of H of T, uh, which gives you the uh, uh, the Fourier transform of this boxcar, and as, as we've heard several times this morning, that is a sync function, which describes the response to a sine wave, for example. So here's a plot of H F squared uh, versus normalized frequency in terms of the uh, sampling frequency. And there's three things you should notice here. First is the resolution here, which is a width at some uh, level, half power perhaps, that's uh, proportional to 1 over t. The, uh, I think my battery's dead. So that's proportional to 1 over t, the uh, length of uh, the data stream that you take into the Fourier transform. Uh, so there's nothing you can do to uh, beat this resolution here of 1 over t. Uh, but as the last speaker said, maybe that's the next generation where you can beat this 1 over t limit to the resolution without increasing the time. That's a challenge. <laughs> so you're stuck with the resolution, but uh, the bad part is that you have this, these side lobes of the sink, in this case the sink squared, 
So the first side lobe uh, gives you a so-called leakage of 4%, which can be quite terrible. That means if you're uh, looking at a, uh, several s sine waves, for example, there'll be one in the band which you want to look at, but there it could be another one out here which will be represented in the main band through aliasing at a level of 4%, and that can really uh, mess you up, especially if there's uh, radio frequency interference out here. The other thing is this is called scalloping, that if you have a sine wave that you're looking at in your uh, Fourier transform, the amplitude it comes out depends exactly where it falls in the band pass. It's, it's largest when it's uh, exactly in the center and it falls off to 2 over pi squared if it's at the edge of the band pass. So the key thing about polyphase filter banks is uh, people didn't want to be uh, left with these high side lobes here and to some extent the scalloping effect. So how can you get less leakage and less scall scalloping? Well, that's the job of the polyphase filter bank. So now I could show you a lot of math, but before I do that, uh, let me just give you uh, how a polyphase filter bank works uh, with a simple recipe. And the first person I, who re really conceived this uh, particular diagram was Gary in 2014, and I stole it for TMS3. Let's suppose that you have uh, uh, a N samples, 1,024 in this case. That's 1,024 samples in time. But we're really only interested in uh, uh, getting at 256 spectral points out. So we've got uh, this factor R, which is N over M, which is in this particular example is 4. So the whole idea is that if you have a uh, uh, 256 points in the center here, uh, you'll get a certain resolution and you'll get those leakage effects. How can you sharpen up that uh, function uh, H of F? Well, the, the whole trick uh, on a polyphase filter bank is you reach beyond the sample, the window you're interested in into the future and into the past to sharpen up this uh, window function. So the typical window function you choose is a sync function. Uh, in this case, it's r equals 4. You usually uh, make four, You make the number of zero crossings equal to uh, this factor r. And then if you're not satisfied with what that gets, you can multiply this by something like a Han, a Han weighting function, which is a raised cosine. You get even better side lobes. So here's a trick. You take the 1,024 spectra, 1,024 time samples, and you break it into four sections. Okay? And so the factor R is a, corresponds to the number of taps in a uh, finite impulse response filter. Uh, and then we separate these, uh, just separate these sections so that you can see them. And uh, what's really amazing to think about is what this, this is a nice sync function, uh, weighting function, which transforms into a uh, top hat or box car to the extent that you can represent the whole sync function by just this little piece of it. See how it's being applied to this, this little section of the time series gets multiplied by this, this section gets multiplied by this, and so forth. This here, and then this inverse the sign of the samples there. So the, the window function as applied to each of these four uh, segments is uh, really kind of weird. So you take these four time segments, 256 points each, uh, with this weighting function applied, and uh, you simply add them up. The audience is completely quiet. <laughs> <laughs> what happens next? <laughs> well, you take this uh, 
this uh, time series uh, collapse in this way, and you take the DFT in the form of a fast Fourier transform, and you get out a single endpoint spectrum. And that's going to have wonderful frequency response. The important thing is that after you're through this 256 time series, you move this whole thing down 256 points, not 1,024. Five minutes, okay. So here is the uh, result of this. If you uh, didn't just did the classical FFT, you're stuck with this uh, H of F function, which is a sink squared. Uh, and this is dB here. So this is really shows the side load. And this is a wonderful uh, result you get from uh, the PFB of a uh, uh, use an R equals 8 here, and I've added the Hanning weighting just so you'll be wowed. But see, the, the response across the band is nearly flat out to the almost the edge. The side lobes are down 40 dB. So this really rejects out of band, uh, out of band uh, contributions in a wonderful way. So, uh, you know, if you actually implemented this, the, the uh, but with the four. FFT step, you have all these channels, and these, are, these show you the uh, adjacent channels. You'd have M adjacent channels in your output spectrum. So uh, let's just take a quick uh, look at the mathematics of this. You can go to TMS. This is exactly page 370 and 371 from the book. And just let me, I'll just like uh, Dan said, you know, don't write this down. Just go back and look at it. So let's see if we can get the key points out of here uh, quickly. So here is a full Fourier transform that you could take with endpoints with a window function on it and the signal, the Fourier transform kernel. Then you decide, then you get your window function, uh, which is a sync function, and you choose uh, the number of zero crossings you want, then you know that the signal is going to be low pass filtered by the action of the sync function. So you go ahead and decimate the spectrum. In other words, you take only every rth point. Uh, so you get m points rather than n points. So the kernel here is this r factor here, it's stepping the index by a factor, a multiplic multiplicative factor by r. So this is the uh, decimated uh, Fourier transform. And uh, you can write that as two, as a double summation. This is over uh, the first each M point, and then you go across all the different uh, segments here with that index. So you get this thing. And uh, it, looking at this, the phase of this uh, kernel is what's very important and maybe hard to see this. But if you factor this out, you can, the last part gives you a exponential factor, which is j2 pi n k prime, but n and k are integers, so this is always 1. Get rid of that. And you can put the rest of the, the kernel together using the fact that uh, uh, n equals r times m and get rid of the r factors. And so you come out with this thing. And so uh, the amazing thing is there's no R's here, so that you can interchange this uh, order of summation. And that's exactly what the uh, um, interchange of filtering and sampling is in real mathematics. So then you come down to here, and you have the uh, uh, sampling uh, summation over R, that was the 4, R equals 4, and here's just the sum of the signal segments added up, and there's one Fourier transform at the end. So it collapsed it into one Fourier transform, which is a real miracle. And to see how this, uh, the workload compares, here's the ratio of the workload to a polyphase filter bank. God, that looks terrible. <laughs> uh, oh, well.
under samples. <laughs> so here's a polyphase filter bank. You have to do the FFT. You only have to do one of them. But you have this uh, overhead of multiplying by the endpoint uh, windowing function. Whereas if you had just done the straight FFT, you would have just had M log M. So this is the extra work in doing the uh, polyphase filter bank. And that comes out to an extra workload of 1 plus R over long 2M. So for example, the case I showed, M is equal to 256, R is equal to 4, N is 1,024. The additional work factor is about 50%. And you could, for example, 8, R equals 8, 1,024, uh, 8, 1, 9, 2, total samples, a factor, it goes, the workload goes up to, a, up by about a factor of 2. So uh, that's the overhead of the polyphase filter bank, but most people think that's a tremendous yield for that uh, investment in time. So uh, let's talk about the applications of the polyphase filter bank. Telecommunications, uh, this can be critically important because that defines the, uh, gives you a very precise band definition. So this is what we would like everybody to use. So that, you know, if, you've, if you're allocated a certain band, you don't spill over into the next guy's band. Use a polyphase filter bank. And the same in receiving them if you don't want to have this overlap. Radio astronomy, it's a little bit different. Uh, the principal uh, use is probably for RFI rejection, is, which is most severe at low frequencies. For example, the EOR experiments are down at 200 megahertz. They're also useful for maybe when you have uh, cosmic masers, which can have tremendous brightness temperatures. And you might be, have a spectrum with features in there that which, which vary in intensity by a factor of uh, 10 to the fifth your sensitivity. So uh, you don't want the strong features spilling over and wiping out the uh, weak features. So that's another useful case. I should point out that in you know, millimeter interferometers, such as the SMA and ALMA, uh, polyphase filter banks are probably not necessary. There's little RFI at frequencies above 100 gigahertz. And the spectral lines are relatively weak and spectral, spectrally uh, resolved. So it's better to put your money into just the basic FFT processor with more capability. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.